Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Jones. I am the Executive Director of Climate Interactive. I'm here with Ava DeLeon, and the two of us are going to lead you through the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. Thank you for being on time. We love that. And we're going to get going by using a poll. So please open another browser window, or you can use your phone, take a picture of this QR code, or go to the link in chat. Look in chat in Zoom, and Ava will have posted the link, pollev.com, climate inter 935. If you would, answer this or fill in the blank for this question. I am blank about climate change. If you have two words, like very encouraged, you got to put a hyphen between the two of them so that they stick together. So please, if you have two words, hyphenate it, but just uh, fill in the blank. I am blank about climate change, and we'll be using this polling more in the workshop, so please do sign in. And I see that some of you are doing it, so let's go see what's going on. Concerned, encouraged, very concerned, extremely concerned, feeling better, apprehensive, discouraged. If you see a word you like, write it again. If you see a word that you agree with, you can make it bigger and you can do this multiple times, put in several words. But uh, if you see something that resonates with you, yep, that's it. Write it and it gets a little bit bigger. Passionate, worried, extremely concerned, depressed. I am expert. I am hooked, enthusiastic, apprehensive, strategizing wisely. I am action oriented. I am deeply concerned. Passion. This is great. You're doing it. We're going to be doing a lot of these polls. So thank you for engaging with it. But concern is the biggest word. Overwhelmed. Pissed off. Very depressed. This is really good. Thank you for this. If you're joining a minute late, I'm Andrew Jones, co-founder, executive director at Climate Interactive. We're going to be digging into the En-ROADS Climate Simulator, which you can use. Ava, would you just go ahead and post the link to the simulator so you can see what we're going to be focusing on today? I'm here with Ava de Leon. We're going to be exploring hope and possibility and the dynamics of the complex biogeochemical system with the simulator called En-ROADS. All right. Concerned, worried, overwhelmed, extremely concerned. Thank you for digging into this so well with the poll. I'm going to jump straight over to some more slides. And I, I even before more intros, I just want to acknowledge why you might be concerned. Many reasons, but the one that's got me is... These temperatures in India we saw last week, nearly 50 degrees C, says the Hindu. I saw something reporting 52 degrees C. Uh, these are very concerning. You have a license. And I understand why you are so concerned and want to do so much to create better futures for people around the world and other lot forms of life. We're going to be using today our simulator En-ROADS. And the simulator En-ROADS, here it is. It is a fast running simulator where you can change futures very quickly. And it allows us to explore things that we care about. In this case, we're testing energy efficiency. It's going to change quickly. So that's why it's so used by top decision makers in business, government, civil society around the world. We just passed 1.2 million users. Why? I think a lot of it is because it's in 20 languages and you it's free. So you can go use it and look at different scenarios. Uh, on heat, I had to go look and see what we had here. We have many impacts. In this case, I would just encourage us to look at the frequency of extreme heat events like what happened in India last week and it's still going on. In 1850 to 1900, 
uh, at zero degrees C above pre-industrial, because that's pre-industrial, we had heat, extreme heat events one in every 50 years. Today, we're about eight in 50. So this is a year because you see what's happening already. Eight in 50 at the temperature we have today. Now what we can do in En-ROADS is play out two futures. If we take very little action and just follow current policies that are around, 30 out of 50 years. But what we're trying to do is change this blue future. This blue future, so there it is. And what you're going to be doing is together, and I'm doing this kind of randomly, just creating another future. Uh, watch the blue dots as I do a lot of things. I'm not even paying much attention. I'm trying to give you the basic idea of what could happen. We got to 1.8. What you just saw is a very different future for heat around the world. Now, not a perfect future. We're exploring here with many impacts. We go not from eight years out of 50 to uh, 30, but instead we're seeing um, 12. Things could be better. This is why we use the simulator to understand what's baked in, what we can change, how we can change it, what the leverage is in making that future happen. But I've kind of gotten ahead of myself. Again, I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the co-founder of Climate, of Climate Interactive. I'm here with Ava DeLeon. We work closely with the team at the MIT Climate Pathways Project. And actually the modeling approach, system dynamics, emerged out of MIT Sloan as well. We are a climate tech nonprofit, and we're here with the vision of seeing greenhouse gas emissions falling rapidly with equitable policy. We're funded by these visionary funders. Thank you very much to all of them. If you or someone you know of wants to join this, uh, this group, please let us know. Ava, would you post, just support it at climateinteractive.org. You can ask any question or suggestions and ideas could go there. Along the way though, in this webinar, if you do have questions that you think could get answered, handled, handled quickly for Ava, please write into the Q&A feature in uh, Zoom. Use the chat too. Talk to each other. You can make comments on this. Many people like to communicate that way. How do we make change with a simulator like this? Well, our vision is to get it to the top decision makers around the world who change the futures, like what we saw reported in the Hindu. Some of our latest evidence, Professor John Sturman from MIT Sloan invited to present to 41 members of the US Congress, I think two weeks ago now. This is Sean Kasten, Representative Sean Kasten and Representative Teresa Leger Fernandez. You can see 41 members of Congress around the table, 75 uh, staff members around them asking questions like you're about to do in this exact workshop. And then using a simulator to support the exploration of the impact of various interventions on various futures. Some more pictures of what that looks like. Learn a social experience, people talking to each other, grounded in the best available science. The dream of this, of course, is getting this to you and to others and to top decision makers via people we haven't even met. Amit Pandey here in Chennai, India, sent some pictures of a workshop that he ran here. Anjali Chowdhury in Ireland doing the same. This is all in the last few weeks. People sending us pictures in Argentina, a big group of engineering students, and so on. All right, let's get back to the topic. Let's get back to the topic of what we're going to do about this challenge. Please go to your Poll Everywhere site again and click to the right or the left of a dot here in the bottom half of the simulator. What are the top overlooked climate solutions? What do you think are ones that don't get talked about as much? Hey, let's go explore these areas. 
renewables, new zero carbon. Hey, maybe we can invent fusion is going to come out. Carbon pricing. Oh, this is great. You get it. Keep on making these changes or making these uh, inputs. Again, if you have questions, go to FAQs, write it in there. Big questions, send to support. And Ava, would you post that link again of the, of the site that can go, wow, look at all these dots. So many different possibilities that people think are overlooked. I, you kind of let me uh, make my choice because so many things have gotten clicked here. Uh, I think I'm going to focus over here on some of the newer things that we've just added and improved. And I know some of you are longtime users of En-ROADS, and you all know that there was this big change that we made. We're excited that we have so much more definition and disaggregation over here under other sources of greenhouse gases, and in particular, methane. And we're going to explore that in the context of this baseline. So first, here's the world that you're landing in. And I'm going to drop this world here. I'm going to copy this scenario link. I'm going to go to Q&A. No, I'm not. I'm going to go to chat. And I'm going to send you it so you can go. If you want to follow along and create this along with me, here is the model itself. We're going to make changes in the context of this baseline future. This baseline future is not our prediction of where things are going. Things are not going here. Why? Because we're going to see an increase in global action to prevent a future where we head to 3.3 degrees and we see that prevalence of extreme heat events. We don't want to see that future. It's not going to happen. It is, however, a reasonable starting point for model experimentation and for meeting the purpose of the model. The purpose of the model is to improve the understanding within the heads of top decision makers in business, civil society, government, that's you all and people you know, about what are the high priority and lower priority things that we can do to address this challenge, improve understanding. So we choose a reasonable baseline and then say, what are the things that would get us down towards the goals that we have? You know the goals we have. We are trying to get that temperature headed up there to well below two degrees or all the way down to 1.5. That's what we're trying to do in order to prevent many of these impacts that we can see here. You could go explore yourself. What is happening in this future? Well, the future of climate is really strongly determined by the future of energy. Where do we get our energy? This is a graph from 2000 to 2100. There's coal and brown. We're assuming a conservative vision for coal that it continues, despite a lot of pressure to get rid of it. Oil in red, gas in blue, methane gas, natural gas. That wedge of green is the expanding wind and solar. Then we have bioenergy and nuclear. Add to that emissions from other sources. What I just showed you, the energy emissions, fill up this black gray area of fossil fuel CO2. Below it is land use CO2, deforestation, land degradation, bioenergy. Above it, F gases like HFCs and SF6. Above it, the methane that we're about to test, and then nitrous oxide, primarily from fertilizer. Some people say, oh, climate change, climate change science is difficult. In a sense, it's not. There's this stuff called greenhouse gas emissions. And when it goes in the air, it traps heat, temperature goes up, and we see the impact. So watch this graph as we make changes. How can we reduce it? and contribute to eventual removals so that we can get that temperature towards our goal. All right. I told you we were going to experiment over here with some of these emissions. They're really about methane. Thanks to the Global Methane Hub, they funded us really improving this sector a lot. And it helps us understand where the methane comes from. Three big sectors. When you engage people on methane, 
energy, mostly leakage, agriculture, this is cows and rice cultivation and manure management, waste, landfills, and wastewater. The biggest wedge is that agricultural sector. With methane, they're also biogenic emissions, like just from the earth. And another time we can go dig into permafrost release. We have modeled those feedback loops and you can change how much release we see from permafrost and clath rates in that side. But this is about human sources of methane or human driven sources of methane. What can be done there? Look over here in this area, waste and leakage. I'm going to reduce waste and leakage and best practices in ag emissions as well. And I'll, I, yeah, I think I'm going to ask you the poll. If we do everything that we simulate the maximum potential with methane, how much does temperature go down? I'd like you to simulate that yourself. I'm curious to see your answer. So go again to the poll, go to the poll and uh, answer the poll question. I'm going to change best practices in energy, cutting leakage, waste for capturing some of the waste and in the area of uh, agriculture, energy. I'm also gonna change production of waste and also going to change diet and food waste is overall agricultural production. So how much does it go down? What do you think? The cons most people think 2.7 to 3. Some people are going under 2 degrees. Maybe it is the answer. All we need to do is address methane. But anyone who answered E or F, I'm going to guide you back to that stack graph. There's a lot of carbon dioxide. There's also a lot of methane. But you, well, we'll see in a second when I simulate it, but uh, 2.7 to 3, 2.7 to 3. Some people think it will go up even. One note, why do we need simulators? One reason is there's such a diversity of opinions. We've got 160 people on here and a huge range of opinions of whether it helps, makes it worse, a little better, a lot better, or it's a sufficient solution. How do we fix a problem when we can't agree even just about how much it would help? This is why we use computer simulations to augment our mental models, which we use to make decisions every day. All right, 2.7 to 3, 2.7 to 3. I'm going to build up these. So the first thing I hit is not the whole answer. I'm going to build up the policies. So the first, best practices in waste and leakage. Here we go. How much there? Watch over on the left. Watch the brown area of waste and energy production. Watch the blue as I implement significant best practices there. 3.3 goes down to 3.1. What do we see? We see the brown area shrink. We see the blue area shrink from waste and energy. And over in the top right, that blue wedge of overall uh, methane. So I'll do it again. See this button up here does a little replay so you can see multiple times. If you use the simulator, know that the decision makers that you're engaging, they wanna see things move. So show them results like that. Okay, that's a big cut, 0.2 degrees. Now let's go look and see agricultural emissions. Here I'm gonna go under into advanced functions. So click on the three dots and you can see that there's this beginner basic level where you can just change everything. That's what's up here. But if I scroll down, you can use detailed settings and we can make a distinction. Best practices for livestock and then also for crops. Watch the yellow area change as I reduce it and then crops and we're down to three. And what if we're able to change diets? Why does this matter? Well, there's how much agricultural production there is. And there's also another question, which is what is the, what we call methane intensity? How much methane gets emitted per unit, per you know, pound of food that's out there? 
So two things you can change. Now we're going to change just less food from animals, but also less food needs to be produced because there's less food waste. Food from animals, watch the yellow area shrink, and then less food waste as well, and we're down to 2.9. So the answer to that quiz question, here's where we were, and most of you were correct that uh, and I hope maybe you use the simulator. If you cheated and did it yourself, good on you. It's okay. So 45% of you, exactly right. We got down to 2.9 with those actions. Now, some co-benefits, some other things I don't know if you noticed, but what I'm going to do is now I'm going to undo all of this and then hit this replay, and you can see the overall effect. Now, there's some other co-benefits that we haven't really talked about yet outside of methane, like what happens to deforestation in this scenario? What happens to deforestation? Let's see. Well, what happens to deforestation is a lot less. Why? There's a lot less deforestation because less food from animals, therefore less need for cattle grazing, or less need for food for cattle from crops. So less need for chopping down trees to make agricultural land to give to the crops, to give to uh, the animals. So we're seeing an effect over there on deforestation. And I think we're gonna see one on overall land use emissions. So LULUCF, land use emissions goes down as well. So some other co-benefits. We also need less fertilizer. Let's go look in, at overall nitrous oxide. I think I have that here. And yep, oh, huge cut in nitrous oxide emissions because of these best practices. Okay, 2.9, a huge cut, and we can see the impact of methane. Uh, we haven't actually done everything that we can do on methane. What else? Well, we've done best practices to cut energy leakage, but the best way to have less methane emissions from energy is not to have as much coal, oil, and gas production and distribution because that's where it's coming from. If we don't need coal, oil, and gas, we don't have all of that leakage and like flaring all of the things that lead to more methane emissions. So I'll just note we're doing the temperature is going to change a lot, but the things that we do to affect coal, oil, and gas also affect this blue area. So watch less coal, less oil, less gas. Another way to do it or to supplement it would be here with carbon pricing, energy efficiency that has less energy demand, electrification, et cetera. So many of these things are cutting overall emissions of uh, methane. And I'm going to pull up, you can see it now. And I'm, now I'm just bragging because I'm so excited by the modeling we did on methane here that you can see methane emissions from energy, uh, coal, oil, gas, and even bioenergy. When you chop down trees, make them into chips, and then burn them, there's some um, incomplete combustion that leads these power plants to emit some carbon, excuse me, some methane. Okay, but I'm gonna back this up because I didn't. I did all that energy stuff way too slowly. So I'm gonna undo all these energy things and let's just count it that we've tested overall um, methane approaches to get us to 2.9. So now I want to see where you think we should go next. I'm going to pull up another poll. Another poll. What would you like to test? Uh, oh, wait. This is not the one. Excuse me. What are the top priorities beyond methane? Vote here. What shall we do next? I really have a lot of them. Okay, I think I'm giving you multiple chances. So go here and vote. 
renewables, discourage coal, oil, gas, nuclear, encourage fusion, carbon pricing, energy efficiency, food systems. We already did that. Discourage bioenergy, electrify transport, afforestation, electrify buildings. We already did the food. We already cut methane. What else shall we do? Is there one more? Oh, we already did the methane and the other gases. So what's winning? Carbon pricing, renewables. Carbon pricing, renewables, coal. Carbon pricing, renewables, coal, transport. Okay, vote away, vote away. If you have questions along the way, please write them into Q&A. Ava will handle what she can. I'll show you that, um, and I'm gonna switch away from this. If you have questions along the way, of course, you can always go here within help and you hit support. And that's gonna open this page where you can click on FAQs, where we have hundreds of FAQs, or you can go submit a question to us and see answers. By the way, I don't think I showed you the level of transparency here that we of course share all of our equations in the model. They're all shared here in this online technical reference guide. So when you go, want to go look at the terrestrial biosphere cycle. You can go see the equations in Greek. You can go see a stock and flow diagram of how it all works. Under the equations area, we can go see each number. Carbon density of wood, 0.5 ton C per ton wood. There it is, the density of wood. So everything is transparently shared. And many of the assumptions are changeable here. So under this, when I changed how much methane leakage there was, there's a lot of debate about that number. How much can we reduce methane leakage? What's the maximum potential abatement of methane leakage in new energy capacity? That is like, how good are the valves when it comes to leaking and the pipelines and all of that? Well, 60% is the maximum change. Now watch the blue area. If it is more, then the best practices would get us more action or it could be less and that is gonna change. Like, this is how we do sensitivity testing. We let you change those numbers yourself and to do it more mechanically and methodically and scientifically, you could go pull the data, copy the data from clipboard and then test if you change assumptions, how much do the results change and do some analysis there. All right, but you just suggested a lot of things that you wanted to add to this scenario. I'm gonna go back and reset the graphs. Here's where we are, 2.9. Well, the best number one you said here was carbon pricing. What carbon price would you like? Write it into chat. I wanna see your opinions about it. Write it into chat. What are the carbon prices that you would like to see? Note, right now, the global average carbon price is $5 a ton because 25% of the world's emissions has a carbon price. And the average is 20 bucks. 20.25, that's $5. Adam wants 160, Mark wants 100, Sonia wants 20, Silvana 300, Karen even 100, 15, 60, 500. Follow CCL, 15 first year and then 10 years everywhere after. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to mentally simulate, I'm gonna put in $100 a ton. Run your mental model. 2.9 goes 2. Point where? 2. Point what? Simulate your mental model. You know, this is not a fancy calculator. We don't use this as a black box model. We use it as a thinking tool and a conversation tool. That's what happened in Congress. People using it to talk to each other, to think together. So we're gonna ask you to run your mental model and think, what do I think it's going to be? And then I'm gonna tell you why you got the result that you did. Here comes 100, here comes 100, 100, boom, 0. 0.6 degrees. 2.9 goes down to 2.6. 
This is why so many people are advocating for a carbon price. I'm also going to put in here, uh, that's ramped up over 10 years. This could go up and over time it could go up. Some people said 300. I'm going to push it way up and just experiment. But what if this increases over time years to start achieving carbon price? Well, that's got to be 2034, but not over 10 years, but over many years. Okay, final carbon price. There it is. Okay, 300. If it goes up to 300, then you get all the way to 2, 2.1. Okay, carbon price, powerful way. Why? One reason that's overlooked is that if it gets implemented soon, it leads us to use less coal, oil, and gas infrastructure most immediately. It's not delayed. Planting trees is very delayed. Waiting for fusion to ramp up is very delayed. These are the competitors to fossil fuels. Carbon pricing directly leads us to emit less fossil fuels soon. So that is one reason why it is so powerful here. But I wanna note there are two ways to get here that kind of complement each other. I'd like to undo all of that and then go back and note that as some of you noted that there is another way to go about getting down further which is a promoting the clean energy revolution so when we encourage renewables and when we break through the storage challenge that we face because so much of renewables wind and solar is variable we need to handle long-term storage challenges. So if we have a breakthrough, say, in storage from hydrogen and from other sources like big batteries and so on, if we complement that with electrification, energy efficiency, even other sources like new zero carbon, another path to get down towards two degrees. There was an interesting framing that I really liked from a someone who wrote a paper and they wrote it, Iveta Gerasimchuk, a new narrative in climate talks, cutting emissions with both arms of the scissors. One arm of the scissors we saw first, discouraging fossil fuels, the top of the scissors, the bottom of the scissors, encouraging clean energy. Those two cutting greenhouse gas emissions. So in this scenario that I'm creating with you, what if we do both together? Pressure on coal, oil and gas, and carbon pricing. And it is more realistic politically and socially to see the world embracing lower carbon prices like that as a policy to get us down towards 1.8. The two of these things working together could be a way to get there. As we think about this kind of future, and particularly with carbon price, we need to ask questions about equity because one concern we have is that when you set a carbon price, that will raise the cost of energy. It raises the cost of uh, electricity. I think we have that in here. We got some funding to add this. First, it makes it more expensive, electricity. Then those energy bills goes down as the clean energy revolution kicks in. Cost of oil, which is connected to filling up your gas tank, there is a concern there because those prices are higher. Some of the proposals on carbon price is to dividend back some of the revenue from carbon prices back to people as a carbon fee and dividend. What could we dividend back? Some of the revenue, such as the revenue from taxes, $3.2 trillion a year from that carbon price. Okay, we're putting it together. We're getting below two degrees. What are we missing? Well, what else is needed? And I'll turn it over to you again. 
I'm going to go to share your scenario, copy scenario link, and I'm going to chat. I'm going to drop in here. Here's the link. What do we need to get down even further below 1.5? The best way to figure that out is to go see, well, where are the gases? <laughs> what is the source of the warming? Here we have fossil CO2 in black, F gases, methane, nitrous oxide. Land use CO2 is still positive. What if we cut deforestation? That's another chunk of reduction. We already cut deforestation some by cutting the drivers of it with food and food waste. Okay, diets and food waste. Below there, what else is needed? Well, I'm going to look into see in chat. Anyone have some suggestions? What are the things if we want to dream of getting down well below 1.8 all the way to 1.5? Maybe those nature-based carbon removal. Nature-based is what several people are writing into chat. The two that we have here that we've modeled are planting trees and then also ag soil sequestration. And let's go change them. And what if we did half of what the Royal Society thinks is possible? There we get really close to 1.5. Dreaming a little bit more, maybe other carbon removal would be necessary to get us down all the way to 1.5 as technically possible and to get all the way, this is the suite of things that we would simulate uh, that would be needed. Okay, you've just seen a lot. You proposed a lot of actions, we simulated them. What has happened so far? What do I hope is landing with you? Well, what did we see? There was no one thing. Even big solutions like a carbon price isn't enough or methane isn't enough on its own. There's no one big thing. It takes many seeds to plant this garden at different scales from personal to community to state, province, business, corporation, country, global, and in many sectors of the world because we put together a whole suite of policies no one big thing, many seeds to plant the garden. And we saw some priorities. What really bent the curve? Well, things that lead us to not burn coal, oil, and gas soon in the next 10 or 15 years, not out way in the future. My colleague Jonathan Foley said it well, that now is better than new. Things that keep us from emitting carbon now is better than delayed actions, and we explored several of those. The other is that it's still possible. It's still possible if we can do those actions to cut coal, oil, and gas, reduce methane in its three big areas, and protect forests to reduce deforestation and with changing food systems. That's the suite of what is needed and are the priorities. And it's still possible. It is still possible to bend this curve to avoid the worst case scenarios on this issue. When I say it's possible, I want you to just look at this scenario for a second and consider, we spent a lot of time talking about worst case scenarios, but we can talk about some better ones, some better case scenarios that bring some surprising results addressing environmental injustice. One in 10 deaths around the world are due to air pollution from energy, PM 2.5 emissions. In this scenario, mostly because we addressed coal, look what happens to PM 2.5, small particulates that are implicated in cardiovascular disease, asthma, and lung disease. Look how steeply and how soon that blue line falls. Think of the health impacts and health savings from this amazing result. Also, going back to other results, we were facing a world where 30 out of 150 days would have 
years like what's happening in India. Remember this I showed you at the start? Eight out of 50 years have extreme weather events. Next in 2130. Now it's not eight, it's only nine. Things it could get, we could avoid so much future damage if we prevent. Look at that. It goes only up to nine, not to 30. That is a remarkable improvement. I encourage you to go look in this scenario and see some of the other things. I'll just, let's just enjoy it. Oceans begin to recover the acidification that is going on there. Uh, biodiversity benefits hugely from this world. Species losing more than 50% of their climatic range. Insects, one of the building blocks of ecosystems around the world. Not a 51% change, in, but 6%. Biodiversity does so much better in these much lower temperature futures. So I'm going to be silent for a minute. And I invite you to be silent with me and think, what would you love about being part of a world on track to making something beautiful like this happen? What would you love about being part of a world on track to making something like this happen? I'm gonna get my phone here. I'm getting my timer to make sure it is a true minute here we go. Silence. All right, that was a minute. Go to the poll, open your poll. Here we go. I'm going to open, what would you love? Here it comes. What would you love? Please write into the poll. We talk in the climate space so much about scenarios we don't love. <laughs> Better outcome for all now and in the future. Taking part, making our planet greener for generations to come. Feeling secure, feeling optimistic. Everyone caring about each other and the planet's future. Inspire people in action. A future for the children. You'd love helping save the world from ourselves. International cooperation, international cooperation, saving biodiversity, the web of life, species other than humans, not lose my home to rising sea level. We haven't even looked at some of those maps. Hope for the future. Hope for the future. Practicing reciprocity that we give, we receive together. Liliana. Interested what that is. Write more about Liliana. Better future for my grandchildren. And what if Liliana is somebody watching the world change? Children have a future. Access to clean air and clean water. Relief. Yes, relief. Showing your children flowers in the cornfield and insects, wonderful. A more positive climate future would make me feel better about having children. Thank you. A better future for children and elders. 
preserving the habitability of the planet, bringing peace to the planet and the humans who are here. Community can make a difference. Community, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, is that what that is? Another solution, sustainable aviation fuel? I would love to feel optimistic, safer. My son and my grandson would be better off, a better world for future generations. Great. Thank you. So as you think about this, I'd like you to encourage you to think about your role in making this happen in several ways. Elise Amel made a diagram that I think is pretty helpful. Think of layers of an onion. There's the person it says in the middle and different layers of influence that you have, personal and private, learning, donating money and time, walk, reduce, reuse. This is your personal carbon footprint, all that you can do. And if we wanna go there, I actually made some slides of the experiments in my life, in my family's life, in my house, in my energy system. Uh, by the way, I think this is particularly helpful in two ways. It, it, it makes us humble when we go to change others. When we say you ought to change, we know how hard it is because we're doing it ourselves. And it also gives us uh, just a little bit more standing to be able to speak confidently that we're part of the solution. And note that personal action is only a small part of what's needed in those scenarios that I just showed you. It really is collective action that moves most of those sliders. We need both. Social networks, sharing material goods, teaching, persuading, social media, the, your ability to engage other people. Then organizational, if you're professionals, what are you doing in your business to be part of the solution? Then public, do you have a role in public collective action? Then in cultural norms, this last, last layer out here. So thinking about action in several layers. Now, before inviting you to share what you're doing, uh, just note some of the things that you can do. One action is if you're in one of those businesses uh, to invite a facilitator such as us or some of the 780 people around the world who run these workshops to engage your colleagues, your communities with a one hour exercise, a two hour role play or a customized experience. We have all these examples of people who've run them in various businesses. We offer this workshop customized to different businesses. Send an email there to solutions at climateinteractive.org. We also offer a, uh, you can run this workshop yourself in the course. So here on our website, uh, you can go under here and just say, get involved with the training. Here is a training where you can watch 63 short videos to learn how to run this workshop. There are people, if you are an En-ROADS Climate Ambassador who's gone through this and are open to running it, Actually, this is your moment in chat. If you are an En-ROADS Climate Ambassador right now, uh, one of these people, uh, write into chat, say, I am one of these people who can run this workshop. I took the course and contact me. Why not make your case to go do it? Write it into chat here. Here's are all the people who have gone through this. But getting back to the question, I want to just really shift the flow of this. So we're engaged. So therefore, what are you going to do next? And I don't necessarily mean with En-ROADS, but that'd be fine too. What are you going to do next? Right into the poll. You see a vision of what you want. You talked about what you would love about it. We think about a various levels of action. You're going to become an ambassador. You're gonna become an ambassador and engage top decision makers with this rounded tool to encourage conversations. Protest, use your voice to protest policies and actions that 
don't fit your values. Include this tool in my course. Love it. It's so interactive. Great. Promote sustainable agriculture. You saw that first thing we did, how powerful sustainable agriculture is in addressing climate change. Reflect and take action. Reduce animal product consumption. You saw how important it was when we changed food from animals. Teach your students. Help younger voters under 40 to vote in November. Oh, there's a link to something. Okay, ARC G something, ARC GIS, maybe that's a GIS system. Use En-ROADS in your class in the fall. Keep driving your EV and use your solar panels. Vote. You're going to become an ambassador. In two weeks, you're going to change your heat pump system. Great. More workshops promoting community solar. You're going to lead a climate solution game. That's our role play game we haven't told you about. Ava, would you post the link to the game? We have a role play game that we share. Community outreach, encourage policy in your state. Teach about possible ways to decrease temperature. Make personal changes and advocate. Engage politicians to pass climate action laws. Help craft policies by lobbying. Run more En-ROADS workshops. Complete the En-ROADS training. I hope it's fun and engaging and you can use it. Look at what can be done to decarbonize the grid. It's going on in Massachusetts. Fantastic. Syllabus for college and high school students. Fantastic. With Connect with your network. Consume less. Make the most of surplus food and keep it out of landfills. Okay, so here's the journey that we've had so far. We talked about what we saw in India. We agree we don't want it. We started experimenting with the many actions that could get us to a better future. We saw what were higher priority, what were lower, and had some general insights into what's really needed. Talked about what we would love about that future. Think about what our role can be and talked and shared a little bit about what action that we might take. It's really the core of what we want to share with you. So I want to ask you now, now here is another question. I am blank about climate change. Hopeful. If you see a word that resonates with you, write it again, it'll get bigger. Terrified, motivated, enthusiastic, energized, more hopeful, passionate, concerned, motivated, less scared, more ha makes me it's so meaningful to see the what yeah the the anxiety that we carry with us it's just not helpful let's get past that anxiety let's get past it okay less scared apprehensive thankful more hopeful. Hope dies last. <laughs> Wonderful. Again, hyphenate two word answers. Energized, thankful, empowered, still something, upset, cautiously optimistic, cautiously optimistic, concerned, anxious, motivated, motivated and hopeful, motivated and hopeful. Well, pulling this together now, I just want to note the offer to you. And I'm going to just take a second and grab some of this so that we can see it really big. I want you to see the contrast. Pardon the uh, work with uh, PowerPoint, but this is just too cool to see what you just came up with 
And then I'm going to remind everybody where we were 60 minutes ago as an offer to what experience you can create for your colleagues. I'm going to make it really big. Uh, here we go. I hope this worked. I've never done this in real time, but here's, oh, it was moving. It was moving. Let me do it again. So it's not so, uh, I want to get it really good. So it is really clear. Okay. Here it comes. Here's where we were. This is where we are. We started. An hour ago, an hour ago, think of the possibilities for you engaging people from going from concerned, overwhelmed, and worried and anxious to where I think we need to be. Hopeful, motivated, concerned, still concerned. Some people still terrified. That's okay. This is the journey we need to bring people on. Notice as you're engaging people, anybody you engage, this is not a purely rational brain experience about the numbers, about electrification and carbon pricing, et cetera. Although that's part of it, necessary but not sufficient. This is a journey of the heart. This is a journey of the spirit. We need to acknowledge who we are as people and leaders in this and make space like we did here just with a minute or asking people how they're feeling. Ultimately, we're gonna take action, not because it's profitable. We're gonna do it because we know it's the right thing to do. We all know that. We need to reach inside of ourselves, acknowledge we have both of these sides, lead with the head and lead with the heart. We can make this kind of future. It's not gonna be easy, my friends. It's gonna be worth it. Go get them.